This month, as America pays homage to African Americans who have changed the course of history, the establishment shows us a revised version of black history that omits a critical piece, the black radical political tradition. The mainstream narrative erases the attack on black liberation movements in the 60s and 70s, where the horrors of COINTELPRO effectively neutralized and destroyed prominent black radical leaders and organizations. The black radical tradition is a collective of ideologies for liberation, from pan-Africanism to black Marxism, that sees issues like police brutality and inequality as systemic injustices, perpetuated by class warfare, and is rooted in internationalism and anti-imperialism. To honor Black History Month, we want to highlight a few of the many voices that are keeping this political tradition alive. On January 10th of this year, hundreds of people from all over the country converged in Philadelphia to show this fire is still burning, despite all the attempts to extinguish it. Hosted by the Philadelphia-based Black Radical Organizing Collective, held at Temple University, the Black Radical Tradition in Our Time Conference provided a platform for organizers young and old, from Black Panthers to Black Lives Matter to generate discussion and action in challenging white supremacy and capitalism in anticipating the next stage of the Black Liberation Movement. Keynote of the conference, Dr. Angela Davis, renowned author and scholar rooted in this tradition, reminds us of those who paved the way. So what does radical mean? Aside from taking things at the root, it means opposition to racism in the tradition of Ida B. Well. It means anti-capitalism in the tradition of Claudia Jones and Paul Rocha. It means resistance to settler colonialism in the tradition of Hasanola. It means dedication to working class struggles in the tradition of Lucy Parsons Gonzalez, Henry Winston, and Hosea Hudson. Art and struggle in the tradition of Max Roach and Nina Simone. Also at the conference was Cornel West, professor emeritus at Princeton University and one of the world's leading intellectuals. We sat down with West to hear his thoughts on Black History Month in the context of U.S. empire. Black history is really about the truth. And the condition of truth is always to allow suffering to speak, no matter whose suffering it is. And of course, this conference is about the black radical tradition. You're talking about W.B. Du Bois and C.L.R. James and Ella Baker and Ida B. Wells Barnett. They were willing to allow suffering to speak across the board and then bear witness and live and die for something bigger than them. Mm-hmm. The Black Lives Matter movement today is, of course, of historic significance. Uh, Every movement has different tendencies and strategies. What's your view about the essential need to target the core structures of empire, imperialism, and capitalism versus just stopping at reforms? The American exceptionalism is so seductive. One wants to think that somehow we were a city on the hill that began with innocence and and moved on to a, a road to a perfect union, as it were. Whereas, of course, we began as a settler colonial society, and we had class struggles going on, gender struggles, racial struggles, and sexual orientational struggles, and disabled trying to gain access to some decent treatment. And so black history says, well, let's just tell this truth. America was on the one hand an imperial adventure, and on the other hand was a very fragile experiment in democracy with imperial backdrop and white supremacist foundation and of course class struggles and gender struggles. And then of course some heroic Americans of all colors trying to resist all of those structures of domination. And that's what we accent, the resilience, the resistance 
real democracy, treating people decency across race, across gender, across sexual orientation, and across national boundaries. Malcolm X said that uh, racism can't exist without capitalism. I wanted you to see what you thought about that statement and what it means. Well, I think you go back to Eric Williams, 1944, in Capitalism and Slavery. He argued, of course, that the very foundation of modern capitalist development, going back to the cotton mills in, 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 in England, rested on enslaved black labor. So that capitalism is historical. Uh, contingent development, and it emerged at a particular time in which it took off, as it were, based on the enslavement of black people. They had to come up with a rationalization of it. White supremacy was a rationalization of it, and it began to saturate every nook and cranny of not just American society, but various parts of the world. And so uh, Malcolm X is absolutely right about that. And in the end, it's really a matter of um, trying to be a person of in, in, integrity and honesty and decency and being able to face the truth and believing, for example, in our contemporary context that a, um, a baby in Yemen or Pakistan or Afghanistan or Somalia that's killed by U.S. drones has the same value and significance as children killed in Newtown, Connecticut, or killed in Roseburg, Oregon, or the south side of Chicago. So it's a basic kind of acknowledgment of our common humanity. And if you really believe that, it makes you an anti-imperialist, because America is going to tell some lies about itself. Why would President Obama have a press conference when an American's killed by drones, or an Italian's killed by drones, and not a mumbling word about those 235 precious babies who have been killed by U.S. drones? And that's a hypocrisy, that's a, a, a moral, uh, not just inconsistency, but it's a moral barbarity that Martin Luther King Jr., for example, uh, talked about in regard to Vietnam, and we have to talk about it in regard to U.S. imperial powers. It seems like in the 60s and 70s, a lot of the black liberation struggle had that internationalism in mind. Well, I mean, part of it is we live in a neoliberal era in which you privatize, you financialize, you militarize in the, in the name of the flag, even as multinational banks and corporations are making profits across the board. 1% of the population own 42% of the wealth. Uh, the flag waving that goes on oftentimes is to try to keep fellow citizens, especially black citizens, sleepwalking. And with a black president, with a black attorney general, black homeland security in the, in, in, in the cabinet, uh, of the Obama administration, it's easy to try to convince black people to focus solely on the domestic situation and not to view themselves as citizens of the world. What should be the focus for white allies to stand in solidarity with the black struggle today? No, I think there's always been different voices and different tensions in the black freedom movement. I think the black radical tradition, though, has always embraced persons of integrity and honesty and uh, decency, whatever color they are, and be they, the John Browns, the Ann Bradens, the Harry Magdoffs, the Paul Sweezys. Uh, we can go on and on, the Joseph Swartzes and others. We can go on and on of those uh, white brothers and sisters who've been willing to cut radically against the grain when it comes to white supremacy. Now, it's true. There's always been certain black voices tied to black nationalist traditions sometimes that uh, were highly suspicious of white comrades across the board. But usually when the white comrades prove themselves and become tried and true and really battle ready, and your back's against the wall, you recognize who's for real and who isn't. And in the end, who's for real is never a function of skin pigmentation, ever. When you're true to yourself, that's just the way the world is. Human beings, in the end, have the capacity to burst out of their ra ra racial categories and become the kind of human beings that we expect them to be. Uh, and and in so in that sense, I think the black radical tradition has been a much more universalistic, internationalist, global, anti-imperialist, and critical of capitalism. And lastly, um, 
any message to reclaim black history, to combat the historical revisionism that has just permeated and toxified the narrative? Yeah, I think that there's been wonderful breakthroughs, of course, in American historiography from the Eric Foners and David Bryan Davises and, uh, um, of course, W.B. Du Bois and Carl Woodson uh, in the past. Uh, and so it's hard to live in a world of mendacity when it comes to the writing of American history in light of which texts are available. Howard Zinn and the others, you see. In terms of popular discourse, that's something else. Corporate media, don't look for truth, past or present. There you get all of the myths of America, all the claims of how wonderful we've been. Land of religious liberty, but for 244 years, black people had no right to worship God without white supervision. That's supposed to be the land of religious liberty, and that's 22% of your population. So it's those kinds of contradictions and hypocrisies that the historians have been very upfront about. Edward Baptist's magnificent new book on capitalism and slavery, which builds on Eric Williams' 1944 text. So the scholars, I, I think, have done some magnificent jobs in the last 40, 50 years. It just has to trickle down in public dialogue. We, poor and working people have no monopoly on goodness or beauty or truth, but they are precious human beings, and they're catching too much hell in this present situation, in the context of the American empire, in the context of the failures of the capitalist economy. Figures like Cornel West and Angela Davis were joined by a new generation of radical thinkers and leaders in the tradition. Professor Margaret Stevens is the director of the Urban Issues Institute at Essex County College a U.S. Army veteran who became an advocate for women's service members and a leading organizer against the Iraq War. During Black History Month, the establishment loves to tell us what parts of black history to focus on and what lessons we can learn from them. Uh, What are the real key pieces of black history that have been omitted from the historical narrative and what lessons can be gleaned from them? Regardless of how we want to understand it, we've been taught black history as a sort of series of great men. And these are what the great men have contributed to the world. And it's just nothing but a re-articulation of bourgeois white history, how that's taught, how the American Revolution is taught, how anything is taught is just a series of, you know, George Washington's and Thomas Jefferson. So I think all people are emptied of any substantive analysis of history under capitalism. It's not just black people, but all people, all working class people above all are denied their history as a class, a history of struggle and contradiction and everything that that entails. It falls back on that tendency toward cult of personality and individualism, which really is the crux of bourgeois thinking, period. Um, And so I think that for those of us studying black history, when we find ourselves constantly gravitating towards great men, which could be, you know, great women too, I think that we miss the point, which is about the sort of the class-based approach, the mass struggle, the organizations, the collectives, the social aspect of what makes individual leaders great and what and what makes them unable to do certain things at any given moment in history. So that's one critical aspect of history I think that we need to look at. And the other thing is that you know, as from a radical perspective, it's really easy to line up a bunch of leaders and then say, oh, they were all sellouts. But these are the real ones. What we forget is that the two are intertwined. And so often the radical movements were, were just a sort of a sharper reflection of the sellouts. We often get into this sort of Malcolm versus Martin thing when we're looking at it from a radical perspective that, that doesn't understand the complexity of all, and, the, and, the, and the limitations of all of these movements at any particular moment in history. I know I'm speaking generally, but I think that these are some of the key tools that you should keep in mind as you approach black history. Women's leadership in the black radical tradition was a hallmark at the conference. As young women have been recognized as being at the forefront of Black Lives Matter, women who have been at the forefront of the black struggle for decades encouraged their successors. This government, this corporate murderers that you know, try to destroy all of the life that we first. That's what we fight. And we're fighting it not only for women, we fight it for our brothers, our husbands, our loved ones. So I'm saying, again, I am a proud black woman, a revolutionary woman, and I know one thing, I know where power is, 
and I know where the hell it's not. And it's not in this government. They give us the illusion of power because of these muffins. <laughs> conference was even joined by Mumia Abu-Jamal. His speech from a prison phone was a reminder of those who sacrificed life and freedom in the very real struggle for black liberation. Good evening, Comrade Mumia. Considered one of the most important political prisoners in U.S. history, Mumia is a former Black Panther unjustly serving life without parole in a Philadelphia penitentiary. From prison, Mumia has become an internationally renowned political and social commentator. He's published several books, including Reflections from a Prisoner of Conscience and Live from Death Row. As we witness the cop riots of violence against Black life in the midst of neoliberal America, in the age of Obama, no less, it's vital that we learn the lessons of history especially during the COINTELPRO era. As many of us know, history, real history, tells us more about today than yesterday, for it provides a roadmap of how we got here. What was the central objective of the FBI's COINTELPRO operation? With the goals to destroy, disrupt, and neutralize black leaders are stated clearly. The central objective wasn't merely to destroy, say, Martin Luther King, for example. It was to replace him with a figure of their own choosing to essentially take over the civil rights and black freedom movement by placing their puppet on the throne. This plot was personally approved by FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover in January of 1964. It was in all but name an attempted coup, the toppling of a black leader to impose a puppet that they could control. It was, in essence, the same thing that happened in Iran, in Guatemala, in Haiti, in Iraq, and in many, many countries. What happened abroad, on the periphery of empire, was tried here in its interior. For in a white nation, blacks are eternal foreigners, aliens, and thus 
outside the realm of alleged constitutional rights. For if this can be done against a mild, nonviolent Christian minister of the Gospels, what can be done against you? Under the surveillance and infiltration of the Black Freedom Movement and killings of people like Deputy Chairman of the Illinois Chapter of the Black Panther Party, Fred Hampton, in his sleep, by the way, we see that the FBI functioned as race police. They also demonstrated what we see all around us today, the culture of police impunity. The road from the state murder of Fred Hampton on December 4, 1969, leads directly to the killing of young Laquan McDonald in recent days in Chicago, for both are expressions of the ugly and recurrent phenomenon of police impunity, the right to murder if the victim is a black person. Today, as the U.S. embarks on a new century, it's perfectly acceptable to large segments of the American population to beat someone to death, to shoot them, to choke them to death, men, women, even babies, with perfect impunity. How can this be? But American roots of police were born quite differently and for different reasons. Founded as slave patrols in the 1720s in the Barbadian British colony of the Carolinas, the body of armed white men had one primary duty, control Africans as a large labor source. Their movements were monitored daily to protect the property of the landowning class. Times change, of course, yet some things remain. In this neoliberal era, when the political class sold the remaining shreds of their souls to the corporations and dispatched millions of jobs overseas under NAFTA and CAFTA, the role of police sharpened as they were equipped with weapons of war, ostensibly in response to fake wars on terrorism. We saw the real role in Ferguson, 2014. Remember COINTELPRO? All of those acts, although illegal, were answered by impunity. The neoliberal state, now presiding over an open crisis of capitalism, goes one step better. In a moment of national fear, think 9-11, it passes the so-called Patriot Act, and voila, in one false swoop, every crime of COINTELPRO is made legal. Phone tap, constant surveillance, snitches and rats, Black sites, secret prisons, no problem. Because it's all legal. Because everything police do in a police state is legal. But the quote moves John Africa. Just because it's legal, don't make it right. Now, Black Lives Matter enters the cipher. Born by women, grown by women, nurtured by women. It is beautiful to behold. It's movement time again. We welcome you right on. I thank you all. Wanna move? Long live John Africa and all black lives matter. Long live revolution. Several days of workshops, panels, and discussions with a diverse range of ages and backgrounds. The energy and power of the conference showed that as much as the Empire tries to write black history for us, there are legends and new leaders who are making black history right now in the tradition that challenges the empire's pillars.